I'm always first. I'll let other people go, but I got one. Whatever. Nope. You're last. All right. I'll go last. <laughs> you live your fate. You will always be last. You'll be the last human to die, too, which is actually not so bad. I highly doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen Children of Men? Uh, the one pregnant woman? Is that what I'm thinking of? <laughs> yes, there was a pregnant woman in it. Anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's all good. Any questions other than Brandon? It seems like Brandon has a question. You can just go ahead and ask it. I don't think anyone else has one right now. All right. Well, I like talked to everybody at the beginning, um, and I think it pertains to art. You know, I feel like there's some value to it. Um, so I work for that VR company out of Ohio. That and VR company they, is that what's called? It, well, it's called Sphere VR, um, oh, Sphere okay. Virtual Reality. Um, and so I work for them, and they pay me pretty well. Yeah, um, I, I love them. They're great to work with. Um, but I also work at a Vans retail store. Oh, okay. Um, I work probably 10 to 15 hours a week there. But my paycheck, I only get paid uh, twice a week or uh, once every two weeks. And it's usually like 100 to 150 bucks, which is terrible. It's like the worst paying job I've ever had. Um, and then the VR company just uh, said that they have like up to six months of like for sure work that they have to pay me. And you know, keep me busy. Um, and I guess my question is, is like, I feel like I'm wasting my time at Vans. Um, okay. Like, like the money that I'm getting versus the time that I'm sacrificing isn't really worth it for me. Uh, I, I feel like, and I don't know if it's a smart ten, decision to just... 10 hours for $100? Every two weeks. So I, I'm working at roughly... Wait. Yeah. So 20 hours? Yeah, so around 20 hours... Wait, twenty hours, and you're getting a hundred bucks. Hundred to one hundred fifty bucks, like it's right in. The, That's like know, five to six dollars. Yeah, it's terrible. An hour. Oh yeah, that is well, an absolute waste of your time. Even if, uh, even if you didn't have this VR that. job, yeah, if you didn't have this VR job, it would have still been a waste of time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because think about it, like five. Like, you know, you could probably go to DeviantArt and do commission artwork for, like, $10 a pop, right? I mean, it's, like, super low pay and stuff, but at least you'd be working on your craft. Yeah, so last week I made 106 and 36 cents for, you know, 10 sure. to 15 hours of work. So I, I want to show you guys something, and uh, I was going to post this on Facebook soon, but I already posted it on uh or Discord, so if you haven't seen this, you should... Yeah, I made an account over there. It's pretty rad. When he posted okay. it. Great. Did you look for a job? I guess you look. Um, I, I started to. Um, I, I wanted to finish this mentorship and to post up the, okay. the work. I, I, I think that my portfolio is, like, I need to update it um, a lot right now. Like, I don't know if I'm horrible yet, but I know that my Well, you can still apply. Better. This has nothing to do with whether you think you're good enough or not. Someone else might think you're good enough. So I just, you can type in like concept artist. Right. And out of, when I typed in concept artist, there was 84 jobs that popped up. And what's cool about this is it actually shows you how much they're willing to pay you. And what I love about this is that you can do something like part-time, full-time internship. For instance, I put task because I, I don't really have the whereabouts of just doing anything other than do tasks, like something that's just one-off. So like, for instance, Indie Forger. Um, they want game splash screens, website stuff, banner stuff. You should have experience with designing art for games that can be used both digitally and in large format print. I can do that. And they are willing to pay $200, $300. So if I were to just say do the splash art for $300, then I would have to do that within, uh, because my rate goes from $50 an hour to $100 an hour, right? So then if I were to do this, and spend, um, I'll have to spend like six hours on this, 
maximum, which is, for me, a lot of time. Okay? Yeah. I mean, I can get a lot done in six hours. I'm sure you believe that. Yeah. And so I, this is the, the benefit of being a fast painter is that I can take these small paying jobs for small studios without any loss to my own ability of getting my rate. But let's imagine that we go with the, the, the uh, $6 an hour rate that you're getting, right? So that means you would have to work 50 hours to do get the same amount of money right advance yeah. and let's say get game splash or takes you 20 hours which is reasonable right so then you're making um 15 dollars an hour you're making three times as much and again you're working on your craft understand yeah man um yeah this is great this is a great little thing man like uh and it's only going to get bigger and better so making something here is going to be good. I was actually planning on posting a project and just making my portfolio project. See, that was what I didn't understand the whole. Uh, that, I don't understand that, it either. But I was like, do I post each image separately, or do I post all under one project? I don't know. I don't know. I haven't done it either. Just do it. <laughs> just do it. That's the worst case scenario because I was reading about it, and I was like, dude, I just saw somebody so brutal in there when I went to the. The, there was somebody that did like this 3D game, the uh, game design. And this person was just like fucking ruining their lives. Like, you are a terrible game designer. I was like, oh my god, I'm kind of afraid oh. to post. <laughs> I was like, oh, Dude, shit. No, that's stupid. Don't be afraid of that. There's people like that all over the place. If if I if I let what other people thought about me run the way that I run my life, then I would have committed suicide a long time ago. <laughs> okay, there's some people that said some terrible things about me, all right, and to me. And so, uh, it just exists, it just happens. For whatever reason, some of these people had some warranted criticism, and other people have not, you know? And so, uh, I don't let any of these types of things guide me. This is pretty cool. This is about, this is just discovery of different games around. That's awesome. That's cool. And so then you can let's see what his talent does. What's that about? And I'm thinking this is just portfolio stuff. I don't understand. It looks like an ad for a game. Well, this is like it says talent. So this is like how you find the actual people. Maybe it's kind of like uh, endorsements on LinkedIn, kind of, maybe. I like, so this guy says he's a concept artist, so let's check it out. 19, okay. 19 projects. Looks like they just post their artwork. No. Yeah, I mean, it looks like he just posts his portfolio. And uh, seems fine. And see people follow him and whatnot. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's seems like it's legit. You can just totally do that. <laughs> Our, um, I, think, I don't know if you said this. Are you going to be doing like portfolio reviews at the end? Like, is that something? Yeah, if you ask for, I'll ask give for? it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, what, what what is my point about kind of what I just did there? Well, whether you'll you'll get that job by applying, who knows, right? That, that's you can like I've always mentioned this like it, you are never guaranteed anything, okay? Just because you apply somewhere, just because you might actually have the work experience or even talents, doesn't mean that they're going to hire you. You understand me? Yeah. And so you have to respect that and you understand that. Zero to zero dollars. <laughs> yeah, that might not be possible. 2D hours for a, a Mario run like game, five to fifty dollars. So yeah, these are like very modest people that just want to make a game and they just want to have some people to help them out. 
which is great. Which, if it's a cool project, isn't you know a bad idea because. Yeah, because you might become a big part of it, right? And and that's yeah. what's cool about this versus like well, that's what anything else. VR, the, the VR company. Yeah, and, but then you have like people that are willing to pay a lot more, right? And so it's it's just a matter of like, do you want to take these types of jobs or not? You know, um, and you can type in maybe Illustrator too, Illustration, Illustrator. Let's see what that does. Like nine jobs, people looking for a beautiful illustration storybook UI, willing to pay 500 pounds for it. That person understands, has some value. Reforming scenes are required. Actually, maybe not. It's like a lot of illustrations. But this is what I would imagine would happen anyway. Like you still only have like hundreds of dollars. But if you take on a lot of these different jobs and you do really good, um, you can have some money afloat and build your portfolio. Would you put stuff like that on our resume? What? Like, like indie game stuff like that? Um, you know, yeah. for people that like need a resume. Yeah, I don't think anyone really needs a resume. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think uh, resume helps for sure, but uh, portfolio, man, portfolio is really where it's at, dude. Like, well, I guess I'd ask because like a lot of companies ask for resumes when you're applying. So. Yeah, I think that's just a formality. I don't think that's necessarily. Okay. Like a, I know plenty of artists who had no career before, and they've worked for big companies. My, like my buddy De Denny Gardner, like he right out of art center, he just got a job working for Sony Santa Monica. All right, let me show you the kind of stuff he had in his portfolio when he got that job. Um, stuff like this. This is there. I know. Yeah, um, he had that in his portfolio. He had this in his portfolio before he got the job at Sony. Okay. You know, this is just what he had in his portfolio when he graduated. He didn't have anything on his resume. Art Center. And then that's it. And he just got a job. And it goes back to a very simple idea that I want all of you guys to truly understand. Before I continue, I'm going to drink some water. Hold on. Aqua. Um, and that simple, the simple idea is that you just got to be good. You got to be real good. And that sounds so obvious. But it's sometimes the simplest and obvious solutions are the, the right ones, right? And the point I want to really kind of make on a practical sense is you should do everything in your power to just have good work in your portfolio. Building a resume, if people ask you to do it, go for it. Um, don't be like, you know, Anthony Jones' resumes are useful. I'm not going to make one. How dare, <laughs> how dare you ask? This yeah. is my resume. They fuck you from Anthony Jones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't do that. But, like, understand that that's just formalities. Like, if they're asking for your resume, like they have done for me and many of my job opportunities, it's already because they've hired me and they want it for the records. You get it? Like, they want me to do a cover letter, again, just for the records. It has nothing to do with like they needed to see it before they were going to hire me. The reason why they contacted me in the first place is because of what I had in my portfolio. You understand that? Yeah. Um, and you, and to be honest, you want to get a job where that is the leverage, where they are reaching out to you, not you reaching out to them. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the way to do that is just to have amazing work. And how to get amazing work? Just keep at it. Just keep painting. Uh, and just be patient and resilient. Like I was saying earlier, to Rush. Or no, I don't think it was Rush. It was Frank. Okay? Um, and if you have a hard time knowing what, what that quality is, um, there's a great way of finding yeah, out. Yeah, I was going to ask. You just go to ArtStation and then just look at people who are professionals. Oh, those are great. Keep drawing, Mama. Good job, Mama. Keep drawing. 
Those are beautiful. Daughter's drawing. Some fashionistas. It's really cool. That's good. You should use the book, too, to help you out, okay? I want to see some drawings from the book, too, okay? I love you, Suter. Um, yeah, like, here you go. Wait, wait. Like, he works. So, ask yourself a simple question. Um, does your work compete against his? Nope. No, well, then, then if he applies for the same job that you're applying for, then I guess you're not going to get that job, are you? Yeah. You know, it's 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 not like uh, the real world is not like there's like the miniature league. You know, it's not a video game in the sense of like there's like a low ranking jobs that you can just take. Everybody wants to hire the best possible people they can hire. That's just how it works. Okay. And some studios can't afford Wing Wei, so then they'll, you know, want to hire someone that's a little bit more affordable. And that consequently, or that by uh, as a consequence of that, it's usually a student or a low-tier artist. You understand me? Yeah. And so this is how people get job opportunities in general, like even if you're not as good as Wing Wei, right? Like you get a job because they can't afford Wing Wei, or Wing Wei is already hired, you know? But then you have people like... I just found out recently, like, Riot, like, hired Charlie Wen, one of my favorite concept artists. Uh, and I was like, how are they able to take him away from uh, uh, Marvel movies? Oh, because they're filthy rich. They probably just said, <laughs> whatever, yeah, whatever, they, whatever they're paying here, you at Marvel, we'll pay you double that. <laughs> you know? That's how the Riot took a lot of people from Blizzard. They were just like, we'll just double whatever they're paying you in there. And people were like, what? <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. And so, um, small studios can't do that. Like, small studios are like, hey, we can only pay you 50 bucks, you know? <laughs> and you have to be okay with that because you're not Wang Wei yet. Right? And this idea of like... Oh, I will be. I'm, yeah, I don't. I don't I doubt. <laughs> no, like, I don't I doubt that you guys will all be excellent. You know, that's kind of the 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 point of this whole argument is that in time you guys will become great. There's just no doubt if you just keep at it. And the proof is in Wang Wei. He's been painting for a long time, and he's amazing at it. You know, like he himself is an example of what you guys can achieve. In fact, all artists that you admire is an example of what you guys are able to achieve. There's no doubt there, okay? So the problem is is that society, in terms of education, Western education at least, has, has this really skewed idea of you got to be successful but right out of high school or after college, and if you're not, you failed. Like, you don't, you failed at life. Where in the, in Historically speaking, that's just never been true. All right, like if you look back in the time, like people who wanted to become great at something had to spend decades of their life potentially to really become a master of it. At least, at least a decade in a lot of cases. This is why doctors go through so much school, so much school. Engineers go through so much school, and this is why doctors and engineers make a lot of money. And this is why most schools are, hey, you should be a doctor or engineer because they make a lot of money. And it's like, yeah, but that's just because they are literally forced to be specialized. Otherwise, they can never get a career, right? You To get your doctor degree, you have to do, do all the work before they even let you even practice becoming a doctor, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm saying you should apply the same kind of methodology to most other jobs, Right, so then, then the justification of a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollar scholarships or not scholarships, uh, tuition, makes sense then because you will be making that money when you graduate, because you will be a master at that trade, you know. <clears throat> you know, like um, it's apprenticeships, like that's what this mentorship is kind of built around is this idea of like old school apprenticeshiping, right? Except you don't live with me. <laughs> you know, 
I was gonna ask. And uh, we don't meet every single day. <laughs> <laughs> you just live with me. Yeah, but that's how it was, right? People would live in the workshops of their masters, right? And their masters would. Well, apparently, they still have that in Germany. Yeah, that's uh, why I, I was said. Talking to somebody in Discord, and they they were like, "Yeah, I'm doing an apprenticeship." I was like, yeah, what? yeah. Some, and I say Western, um, and that's a general because even Germany is a Western culture, but like I say, most Western ideals because it's a Western idea, like that this is spawned from and obviously eastern countries can follow suit in western ideals but my point is is that this is this is not necessarily the best strategy um i think the best way to if i had to if someone came to me and said you know we don't really like specifically in america like if they're like hey you know we don't like this betsy devos and we wanted to give you a shot at running the education the department of education right anthony jones would you run like Donald Trump read one of your Facebook posts, thinks that you have some real enlightenment and wants you to run this show. First of all, I would decline because exactly. I'm not qualified. <laughs> I don't know exactly. nearly, I don't know nearly enough uh, to really take the job. Right. But if I was forced to take the job, the first thing that I would do is learn everything I need to know uh, about the educational system in general. Right in the states and what works and what doesn't work i would look at the facts <clears throat> and from my personal experience and what i've seen and what i've kind of deduced just on my own research alone is that the educational system that works are the ones that are found in those like swiss swiss countries right those norwegian countries which is less school, no homework, and basically uh, a lot more recess. These, I, th I forget specifically which country, I think it might be Norway, but I, don't quote me on that, but it's one of those Norwegian countries. And it could be Denmark, I forget. It's one of them. They basically, what they've done is that they did what I just told you, like they get rid of uh, education in a, in, a, in a very great way. They basically said that kids will go to school for free, obviously, right? And I think all the way to higher education, that, that means including college, okay? And basically, kids go like almost half the time to school so normally like school is like six to seven hours right you wake up super early you go in and you stay there till like the middle of the day like two or three usually right they basically said kids come in a little bit later like maybe nine or ten said so like six or seven in the morning and then they um they leave at like right after lunch so they basically shaved off two to three hours and then when these kids go home, they don't have homework. Okay? And when they are at school, they are outside a lot more than they are inside. In fact, a lot of the lessons that are taught to a lot of these kids are done outside. Right? Or, or in a play environment. And one of the teachers that was talking about this was saying, you know, instead of teaching the kids about nature in a book, we teach about nature outside. They can actually see it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that makes sense to me, right? And then there, the reasoning behind homework is, is like, think about it. Like, you, you put them in school all day, every day, and they're like, they're already bored out of their mind. And then you force them to do more when they go home, right? Uh, the the opportunity for them to retain information, because there's this over, information overload, right? And so these, these kids are not going to be advancing as well as the ones who are a little bit more happier and more, um, um, like, they actually enjoy or want to learn the things that they're given, you know? Because the reason why you guys do so well in my class, for instance, is because you guys want to be concept artists. You get it? Because when I went to school, I had friends um, who on paper it said that they wanted to be concept artists, right? But they did nothing to try to achieve that goal. They just assumed, well, as soon as I graduate college, I'll get a job. You know? 
Some yeah. of them still believe and have this sense of entitlement. In fact, a few of them I've got actually um, visibly angry with them. I'm like, you don't deserve anything. <laughs> you have to earn it, you know? And um, I made mean, that very clear to them. It's like, he's like, like one of my friends was making a, a statement about like whether they weren't giving enough opportunities. It's like, you've been given so many opportunities, you just haven't done anything with it. And, uh, and it's really important that when you, people go to schools or higher education, that they go there because they want to learn the things that they're actually going there for, right? Not because they're just going to have a lucrative career and whatever it may be that they've been convinced into, okay? And so if I had to go and basically capsize the educational system, my first step would be to follow along these Norwegian things, and I, because I highly agree with them. I think this idea of uh, letting your children uh, learn what they want to learn and and cater their individual progress and needs is more powerful than just generalizing what their education should be and just dumping them in a system and just let the system decide how to make their lives work, right? You, we're conditioning our children already in a very bad way. And a lot of what you guys have experienced is, is a product of that conditioning, right? I am I am an example of that too. Like I didn't realize that talent isn't a real thing, right? For for the longest time, I really did believe talent was a thing, like many other people did. Uh, and now I realize no talent doesn't truly exist. It's it's a it's, a, it's an imaginary t term. Like there's really on a grand scale, no reason why we should still believe. Oh, yeah, and it can be, exactly. Drawing can be learned. Becoming creative can be learned. In fact, I believe that as kids, we were organically creative, like naturally born with it. But the education system as it stands beats it out of us, <laughs> right? It looks down on like this idea of being creative. Well, you can't make a real living from that. But guess what? Some of the richest people made livings from being super creative. And I don't mean like in artistic ways either. I mean in ways that aren't artistic. Creative thinking. Yes, absolutely. The kind of person that says, what if we put a music device in something as small as a wallet and it can hold not just one song or a dozen songs, it holds um, potentially tens of thousands, if not millions of songs. The iPad or the iPod, right? It wasn't like Steve Jobs invented um, portable music or digital music even, right? Or even like a circle. He just invented a, a thing that he put all the things that he learned and he thought this is something and it's got to be super simple, one button, you know? And it just like, it took took off, right? Um, the scientists today, I just read, have have the ability to insert information in people's brains. They They figured it out. It's very, very small. It's not at the level of where you can go plug in. Now you learn how to do Kung Fu, like from the Matrix, right? But it's because these scientists saw the Matrix, at least a few of them did, and they're like, what if we can do that? <laughs> you know? Like creativity is is super valuable to us as a species, right? And for for us to kind of beat it out of children to think you can only be these like really rudimentary jobs that are also very important. I'm not trying to knock down jobs that are very like just matter of fact, right? I'm just saying they're not the only jobs. And I think the educational system is just suffering, suffering at teaching your kids this. Um, and so like if I had to go, that would be the first step. First step is make school easier in the sense of less time, more effort on actually teaching sustainable and practical information to your children. Like teaching them how to do their taxes, for instance, when they get to high school. That's practical advice. Not teaching them the history of some war that they don't care anything about. It's important to learn history, but some people just don't care. And some people don't want to make a living knowing history. So you, what you should do is just like, and I believe middle school and high school should be less about teaching them how to read and write and do all that stuff again, which they've done for literally for 12 years. And by the way, uh, the education system already does that, right? Like in America, we have 12 years of English, and yet 
the 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 reading and uh, literacy of American children, teenagers, is getting lower and lower. It's ridiculous. So, so it's clear that just because we like spoon feed you uh, learning how to read and write often doesn't mean you're going to learn how to read and write, right? There's better ways to teach these things. And it's just all ass backwards. And so that would be my first step. My first step would not to be dismantle public education like what Betsy DeVos is trying to do. My first step would be, of course, we need public education. We just need to reformat it. It needs to be better. We need to pay the teachers more money, but the teachers have to deserve to be there. We have to. There's a lot of teachers that are going to lose their jobs because a lot of them don't deserve to be teachers. It sucks. It's a hard reality. But we got to basically say there are teachers there and there are people who want to teach. But instead of paying these people chump, chump change, what if we started paying them uh, re reasonable salaries? And so the teaching actually becomes a very lucrative career, like it is for me. Right? You can totally do that. And and then when you start to have uh, schools that teach people how to teach, then you can it'll be more of like a it'll be a big deal, right? And you did this small. You wanted like this like it, you don't. You don't go around just like capsizing the whole education system overnight either. It'll be it takes fucking time, right? You just slowly say, look, before we fire you, you have to go through this extensive training that we've built, right? And if you can do it and pass it, then you can keep your job. But now you're qualified. But if you don't, you know, we'll give you another chance in the future. But we have to fill this place position with someone who is qualified to teach our children and a future generation. Because the reason why a lot of people don't have jobs uh, in America right now, is not because they're not jobs available, because uh, there's plenty of them. It's because uh, they're not qualified. It's as simple as that. Like a lot of the people who complain, like these businesses complain because uh, they say like some of these employ employees that they get can't read past the third grade level. That's problematic. You know, even for something as simple as like construction, you know what I mean? And so you got to like, that, that'll that be my first step is to reformat it uh, over time, uh, not put it to private business. Uh, privatizing education is a huge mistake. And I won't get too much into it, but basically the crux of privatizing uh, education is as simple as this. Education is the type of thing where if you privatize, um, then you create the opportunity for the people to get paid less, the, the teachers. And that's the problem that I'm trying to say. Teachers already get paid shit, right? So if you have competition where people can start, start to charge lower premiums for education, Jesus Christ, then that means you'd have to pay teachers less money. Or you have to cut funding somewhere, right, to afford these low costs for your customers. So it works okay for like smartphones and shit like that because, uh, you know, it's a product. You just buy the first time and you're fine, you know? Like it's, if you buy a pair of shoes right from Vans, it's fine, <laughs> you know? You can pay, like, it's, you don't need, uh, like, uh, apparently you don't need to pay your employees very well and they'll still work. <laughs> I, and, and even if you did pay them reasonable, like it's still very cheap. It's very easy to train someone on how to sell shoes, Right. It doesn't take, it's not a high cost of entry for training, but when it comes to education, uh, if you treat it like an employee that works at like Walmart, who just has to sell, um, just all common goods, um, yeah, you're, it's going to fail and it's going to fail badly. Right. Does that mean all private schools and stuff don't work? No, of course not. It's just the ones that work cost a lot of money. I'm, I'm technically a private school, right? Yeah, but technically, like nobody, not all people can afford a five hundred dollar entry cost, like a tuition. It's it's a very reasonable cost, right? I think you guys can agree with that. You guys were able, you guys spent the money, right? You guys totally felt like this was a valued uh, investment, but you have to understand, you guys are a selective few who are very pri privileged. As much as you might not know, think that, you guys are. Just like I'm very privileged, and I'm not delusional to that or naive, right? Like when I was going to school, I was going to uh, art 
Institute, Orange County. And whenever there was like these big events, uh, I would go. Because I know like a majority of people, including like mostly half of the people in this class, right? Couldn't go to these events because they don't, you guys don't live in California, right? I do. So I went and I knew, I was like, this is a free Nomen workshop that I can just go and just have to show up. Are you kidding me? Of course I'm going to go, right? There's actually a workshop this weekend, Saturday at AI Inland Empire with uh, Jeffrey Anolt, one of my good friends and a great and badass. He works at Riot. Completely free. You know, and I talked to the guy who hosts these events and he, he tells me like there's like four or 500 people that are enrolled in like game art, for instance, right? The, the program that people would be interested in what's going on, what Jeffrey's doing, you know? And he says out of the people who attend these workshops because it's open to the public, he says a, a vast majority of these people are not from the school. So not only is it free. And it's in your school. Some of these people don't go. <laughs> it's crazy, right? And my whole point is, is that like uh, not everybody has these privileges, and and the people that have these privileges freaking disgust me when they don't take advantage of them, and then they later on they complain why they don't get jobs or opportunities. I'm like, well, you fucking, you're the reason why, dude. <laughs> You could have went to that workshop. You could have talked to him. You could have showed your portfolio. You should, could have got feedback from a, a professional person, you know, for free. Where people uh, across this country uh, have no access to this. People across the world have no access to this. I just talked to a, a student last night. Um, so you know how I was talking about how um, my friend uh, um, uh, uh, Danny Gardner, he just basically graduated from Art Center and he just got a job. Right? Like almost like right away. So I was just talking to a student last night and uh, she's an amazing artist. And I've, I've helped her in the past and she came when we were hanging out in sketch group and I talked to her and she was really concerned. She was feeling a little anxiety because she might not get a job after she graduates. And I said, you'll be fine. I said, it might happen. You might not get that job. And that you should be prepared for that. Okay? But I explained to her, I was like, but you're really good and you're really hardworking. You're really trying, you know? You're doing everything in your power to get that opportunity. You don't want to leave. You want to stay here because she's an international student. And she's like, yeah, but it's really hard. You know, these, these companies won't pay for my my, uh, my stay of, uh, of a broad education because it's just a lot of money. And I was like, yeah, that sucks. So she basically, like, uh, a lot of these um, – Companies don't want to hire her because the, there's a cost of keeping her here, right? Yeah. Um, because she still wants to be a student. And so that's a, a hurdle that she has to go through. And I told her, that sucks. But you're hardworking. You're gonna, it's going to work out for you. I wouldn't worry about it. And I told her, plus, you know, people like me and JP and all the other people that were there. And I was like, we're, we're going to support you. You know, we'll, we'll help you out, you know. So you always have a good support system, and she was very grateful for that. For that, but I, I told her pretty much the same thing I'm telling you guys. I was like, "But listen, you know, this is what frustrates me is because people like you deserve to be working, like right now. But all these external things that are out of your control are preventing you from getting that job, right? And it sucks. But I told her, I was like, "But I know plenty of people who've got past these hurdles." So you can make it. And I told her, you know, even with that being said, I've met a tremendous amount of people who have all of these things, these, these, uh, I've met a good group of people who have none of these hurdles, right? Have none of these constraints to their ability to potentially get a work in this industry and yet complain how hard it is. And, you telling me your story just compounds my already preconceived judgment of these other people that they need to shut the fuck up and get to work. <laughs> okay? Oh, yeah. You know, and I think a lot of you guys, you guys aren't amongst those people because, like I said, you guys took, you guys took advantages of your privilege, which is to afford my class, 
it's not cheap. I'm not saying that you're entirely privileged. You guys are millionaires running around doing whatever you want. I'm just saying that you understood that this is an opportunity that you can take and have, and you took it. You know, it's an investment in, in, into your your larger growth as as artists, right? They can also write it off for your taxes. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and that's fine. Like, and uh, you guys have to understand it. And I'm not trying to say that my class is a privilege entirely. I'm just saying that some people don't in this world have no idea that I have classes. You understand that? And they have no idea that this is an industry that they could be a part of, and they would love to be a part of it if they knew that it existed. You know, like some real people out there that would really, I'm sure, love it. And I've met some of these people. Some of these people are my students that are like, I just saw your stream on Facebook. I didn't know this was a thing. And now, like, I'm working in the industry. Like, this has happened time and time again. And this is one of the greatest things that I can have as a teacher, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and, and, and kind of getting to the point of, like, try to relate to some practical advice to you guys you know when when it comes to like portfolios and like how do i get a job and all stuff um it really is just as simple as having great work yeah and then um you know networking as much as possible and i like to to say make friends don't network and meaning that like when you go to these events don't try to like network try to actually just talk and make friends with people um because Friends want to work with friends. And in the future, someone will be like, hey, you know, uh, Brandon is this really cool guy. He was in my class. He's really nice. We used to hang out, Google Hangouts a lot. And uh, I would like to, to, for us to reach out to him. Maybe we can give him this job opportunity. You know? That happens like 90% of the time. So if you make too many enemies just so you can get that opportunity in your career, uh, you're going to be screwed. I promise you. And um, and if you make tons of friends and you're a very bad artist, uh, you'll succeed more than someone who's actually better than you. Case in point, me. I was pretty bad for quite a while, but I was yet to find work because I went to those Noman workshops. You know what I mean? I went to those talks. I went to events often, constantly got my portfolio reviewed by professionals, often. I would always try things. I would always take advantage of things. I'd always um, look and dig deep, you know? And a lot of people just don't do that. Let's use you as an example. Like, you, you kind of didn't do that. I'm not saying that you're, like I, like I made a point earlier, you guys are amongst the very small percentage of people that I think will make it in the industry, okay? I feel that 90 to, 85 to 90% of my students will all be successful. Not because you guys are all super talented people, because you spent five hundred dollars to take a class for about a month. That takes a lot of strength and willpower. It demonstrates that you guys are taking this shit seriously, okay? And so, uh, when you were asking me, he's like, "Well, how do you think the Unity thing? Should I make a project, or should I do this?" Or you know, you're asking me a lot of questions, which you should. I'm your teacher. I'm here to help you. And I've answered it, right? We we, we answered it, but the the way that I answered it, because I told you, it's like, I actually don't know. Right? But then I said, yeah. you should just do it anyway. Okay, let me see it. And I said, you should just do it anyway. Because you'll find out whether you can or not. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm trying to say is, like, too many people, whoa, this is cool. Good job, mama. Okay, a little bit later. Not right now. Um, close the door, please. Delilah, close the door, please. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I saw, and how, how did I even know that Unity Connect even existed? You understand? Like, how did I, like, do I have, like, a secret messenger bird that, like, lets me know and of all the great opportunities that are available <laughs> to all artists? Probably saw a friend post it, and you're like, what's this? Yeah, and then I just made an account right away. And you did it. Yeah, and I just did it. Exactly. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> I, I don't think it was a friend. I think it was just an ad on my Facebook. Like it, was just, it was just advertised to me. And I think the reason why it was advertised to me is because I'm always interested in game development and stuff of that nature, right? And the algorithms were like, this guy might be into it. And they were right. Algorithms work. Good job. 
Good job, algorithms. You figured me out. <laughs> but that's my point. Like a lot of people just don't do these things. Uh, I'm going to give you a great story of a guy named Julius. I think it's Julius Diego or Diego. Um, he lives in Kenya, and uh, he was basically um, he saw like a video clip or something of somebody. Um, somebody basically doing pole vaulting. I think that's the story. It's irrelevant how you got started, actually. I don't really know. It's not relevant to the, the message I'm trying to make, though. He he saw that, and he's like, oh, dude, that looks dope. And so he started pole vaulting, like a very young age. And he's like, <laughs> you know what? I want to be a pole vaulter. Okay? This is a guy from Kenya. Here are some facts that you need to know to help you understand the context of the story. There is no pole vaulting coaching gyms at all in Kenya. It's not a thing. Here's another fact to help you with the context. They don't sell pole vault poles in Kenya. <laughs> okay? Let alone they have access to gyms even, like kind of gyms that you and I might have access to, right? Like yeah. 24 hour fitness. Like $25 a month, you get like access to tens of thousand dollar equipment. Okay. And a nice bathroom where old men just get naked. Just they sit in the lobby. Anyway. Um, so he made his own gym and he, he made his own pole vault stick. And since there was no coaches of any sort, he learned everything he could from a few hours spent online on YouTube. Mm -hmm over the span of many years and the internet again we have the privilege of having internet in our homes he doesn't have it at his home he had to go to a pc cafe that was miles away from his home you understand like so he had to pay to get the access to this stuff he had and the access that he had wasn't convenient okay and he did that for a long time i think almost a decade and or more than a decade and uh, he is now an Olympic gold medalist, I believe, in pole vaulting from Kenya. Yeah. So when I hear people bitch and moan a little bit about their unwarranted circumstances, um, I think about people like him. I think about the person I was just talking about earlier, right? the artist who has all these circumstances against her. You know? Yeah. And I'm like... Yeah, man, get your shit together, dude. I, I specifically do not care for the the local artists that have this. Most of the people that I'm putting this judgment on are local. Okay, okay. I know I know these people, and I know they're just full of shit. Because <laughs> I live here too, and I'm like, dude, we got it great, man. There's like all kinds of education around here. There's amazing artists and talents all over the place. There's amazing job opportunities, like literally every corner you know there's nothing to complain about they took our jobs why did that person take your job it's not because um you know <laughs> companies outsource to cheaper artists it has nothing to do with that it has everything to do with they're just better than you <laughs> they do it better and they're just better and they're they work better and they are harder worker working and it's just how it is you can still have all those great perks and opportunities is these people that come from abroad who had to work for work visas, you know, by just being better than them. And the tools to be better than a lot of these artists are there. It's just a lot of people are just super entitled. And, uh, and I think you guys should understand that you guys are not amongst those people. And I'm very happy to say that. And I, I want you guys to know, that if you ever want to know how to, to, to get those jobs, it's simple. It's the same for everybody else. Uh, some of you guys will have a harder time than others. These are just facts. But that doesn't prevent people from hiring you anyway, especially if you're remarkably amazing. By the way, Wang Wei is originally from China, and I don't think he speaks much English because every time I see him, I'll try to like talk to him, and he'd just be like, oh. Just walk away. <laughs> I think he just painted that one piece of uh, the orc on the mount, and they were like, "Hey, what's this?" Yeah, yeah. Was like, uh, he did. A, he did. He did a lot of fan art, actually. 
No, it's a it's a bigger story. He's he did tons of Thanos over many years, and they're just like, let's just hire him. And they just <laughs> yeah, he deserved it. He earned it. And then oh, yeah. Blizzard spent all of their effort to pay for his way to get here because they're like he's worth it. I mean, look, if I'm a person who's going to hire somebody, right? Let's do it. Let's pretend we're hiring people. Okay. So this guy, this is pretty good artwork. This is pretty good artwork. This is pretty good. This is pretty good. Um, what else? I mean, a lot of these are really good, but I'm just trying to get a variety. These are pretty good. Let's get some more stylized stuff in here. This is pretty good. I think that one's dice. So, uh, let's see. This person's probably from China. Yep. So if I had to hire this person, I would have to ha hire outside. This person, I think he lives here now, but maybe not. But he's from originally from Sweden. From Germany. Oh, nope. Indonesia. I was like, that might be a Westerner, but I was wrong. Japan. Oh, we found one. Cody. Cody Gramstad. We got one. Found an American. It was the last one. <laughs> so out of the ones that I just randomly yeah, chose, yeah, yeah the, the majority of them that were great artists are not from our country. Okay, so let that be very clear to you. You know, um, unfortunately for people like Trump, uh, companies don't discriminate when it comes to making more money. And if I had to hire the best of the world, um, I'm going to hire the best of the world, regardless of how big a tree <laughs> the company might stand. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so let that be a, a statement to you guys. I saw some questions. Let me see if I can answer some of them. Let me go through them. Let's see. My dad complaining. Are these questions or are these statements? There was a fan art question um, by Josh. Oh, can you just um, explain it? Do you th Talk. do you think it's essential to get more people viewing your stuff, or do you think we should add character concepts to our portfolio and fan art just for fun? Uh, yeah, do everything in your power to get people to look at your stuff, uh, and that includes making more fan art. Yeah, yeah. I, I asked before. before but because you mentioned in our first or second class um, that you get the job from Nintendo by doing a fan art of Mario, or when I remember right. And so, um, yeah, it is always hard for me to decide if it's right to put fan art in your online portfolio or is it... Oh, yeah, sure. It's fine. Okay. Yeah, as long as it's good, I think just don't yeah, put bad true. work in here. Like, if it's bad work, like, uh, here, here's how I think about fan art. Um, and I didn't get a job from Nintendo. I just got jobs in general because of those. People recognized my work, found my work because of those. Okay? There was a job that I got that was specifically catered based off of the company. It was, uh, I did a, a, a Robot Unicorn Attack illustration because I love that game. And then uh, Adult Swim approached me and said, you want to do the actual illustration for this game, the sequel? And I was like, duh. You know, and so that does happen, um, but I wouldn't count on it. Uh, I would count on more just trying to get people to look, find your work. Um, so what, what do I think is good in terms of fan art? I believe fan art should be best served if the artwork is actually like pretty unique. Um, like so, if you go and just draw like. Ariel from Little Mermaid exactly the way that it's portrayed in the original films. Um, I think you missed the mark. Uh, although there's a lot of attraction there and people will, will definitely flock to your work, but it's the kind of the people that are just into just that artwork. You understand? But if you can bring something new to the table, like if you drew Ariel, like the all of the the characters from Disney movies, for instance, in the Game of Thrones context, right? People get attracted to that kind of stuff because it's like a mix. It's a mashup. And mashups work really well. And they, they de actually demonstrate your ability as a concept artist. Because that's kind of what concept artists do. They take an idea and then just mesh it together until it becomes something really cool or palpable 
right? Like when I did my StarCraft uh, concept art, it was in essence StarCraft fan art, right? Because I love StarCraft. The thing that I just did is just make it more cinemified, like make it more realistic feeling. You know? Thank you. Yeah. I, I could have done the same thing on my own, just done the StarCraft concept on my own, make it look super realistic. Uh, but I got paid for it in this instance. Yeah, so I highly encourage fan art, fan art that uh, does a little bit more, <sighs> a little bit more than just, you know, your common just uh, like replication. Like just painting exactly what you saw or what is the original version. Does it make sense? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Thanks. people get way more caught up or more interested if you bring something new to the table versus if you just kind of draw the same old, same old. So, yeah, that's my advice. Yeah, but fan art's great. Um, anything to get you more reputation, um, absolutely try it and do it. In fact, a lot of my fame, I think, came from just doing lots of fan art. But now, like, I'm building a lot of uh, fans from just my own artwork, which is ideal. But I've actually considered doing more fan art. I'm thinking about doing it. It's been a while. And not because it's like, oh, better reach that quota, better reach more fans. Because uh, every time I did fan art, I just genuinely liked doing it. It wasn't about making more fans. It was just about just painting. Because I like it. And I think when you do that, and it's a little bit more honest, uh, you do a better job and you get more people uh, to recognize your work. I think Alyssa got a follow-on question. Go ahead, Alyssa, ask. Art, do you think doing skins, etc., for games like Overwatch League, etc., yeah. could be useful? Yeah, that all, that all falls in the vein of what I was just explaining. Right, like creating your own skins for a video game, that's like very similar to what I was saying. Like if you, like basically what I'm trying to say is the only thing you shouldn't do Or actually, yeah. And maybe Spider-Man's not a good example because some comic book artists just draw, like, they get their jobs because they can draw Spider-Man, right? But that's a different kind of job, right? So let's do Ariel. Hmm. What? Well, I've actually... No way. Uh, that looks so rad. I might have worked on this because I worked on a mermaid thing a long time for Disney. There's no way this is true. I'll watch this trailer later. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so if, if like you uh, drew this, for instance, and this is in your portfolio, um, I don't know if this is, is good. <laughs> right? Because it's like they already have those types of artists. But if you have, like, if you do this, for instance, this is someone else's. Or like, kind of like this one. This is even better. Right? This says a, this sells a different story because it's like, yeah, it's area. And it's it's, it's really, relatively similar to the original design, but it's, like, painted so nicely. You know? Yeah, I think I get the point. <laughs> yeah, and that was to um, uh, Alyssa too. Like, if you wanted to do skins for like a character that already exists, yeah, that's all useful. The way that I imagine it uh, is like, um, or the way that I like people to think about it is like American Idol. Like in American Idol, they don't normally want people to sing original songs, original content, not because they don't believe in original content. Uh, some at some level, I believe that that's kind of true, but uh, on on a larger scale, I don't think so. It's because when someone sings like "Hallelujah," but they do it with like a jazzy tone, 
it's it's dope because we get a sense of like how that person sings with a very popular and already well known song where we can really focus on their actual skills and differences. But if you sing like an original song, like let's say you're like uh, Jack White from White Stripes and you sang one of your original songs and it wasn't famous yet, it was a good song, but you know, you sing it all weird, like you have a very specific tone, you know? Um, you know, you might be scrutinized. And it's, that's not where it exists. So it's important to kind of understand kind of that point of view. And I feel like fan art should be like that. Like you take a already popular thing and you just bring your own, uh, put your own twist on it. I think you'll get more value from that than if you just uh, draw something exactly verbatim. In-house versus freelance? Yeah, hey, what's up? Uh, I have a quick, well, I have a little question because right now I'm I'm working in a studio and actually it's a pretty I mean the the company is great but the the style they have doesn't fit me that much and I started to think like uh, it's better for me to start to work freelance maybe to start to hit companies or jobs that are more like suitable for my style and I was thinking like if you had that experience uh, like jumping from in-house artist to freelance and how was your experience or how you how you managed to do it. Yeah, I, I think it's you already had the answer. You just answered it yourself right now. You just got to start picking it up. Um, but the real, better question that I want to kind of put out there um, is is this, which is uh, whether you like freelance or not. Uh, right? I did it. In, and, and I did it. In the past. Know, yeah, and if you don't, or if you've done it in the past, then you know you have a good sense of it, and you know. I personally like both. I like to work in-house and I like to work freelance. And I'm starting to love more freelance because I don't have to go into an office. But at the same time, I miss going into an office and having other people there and talking with them and, and working and looking over yeah. and saying, whatever. That's really nice. Um, but, you know, and I think the reason why I've loved more freelance recently is because I can just go to the living room and just hang out with my kids. And I've loved my kids very dearly. And um, being around them very often is very nice. And I'm, I'm actually committed to never sacrifice that. And so, uh, you know, that's kind of how I am. But before, I used to only like in-house. I tried freelance, didn't like it, but that's before I had my kids. Yeah. And so things will change. So the, the better question is just to find a, a position where you create circumstances that allow you to kind of switch like if i wanted to go work in a company again i can't like i have enough reputation and enough friends that it might take mm -hmm. a while like it, like there's a possibility it might not happen overnight but it wouldn't take me years either you know yeah um yeah. so i'm in a very good position where i can do freelance or i can work in in-house and i just and i have choices so my 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 point is is that work towards less about whether you're in-house or freelance Work towards more of a style of, of or uh, work towards more of a, a vocation that allows you to be able to have more choices and you can decide because life will always change. And one day yeah. freelance will be the optimal choice. And if you're in a position where you can choose to do freelance, that is better than whether to decide, well, I need to make a choice because I don't know if I'll ever get a job again in a while, right? Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and so... Uh, and so that's what I'm trying to get at is like, instead of you thinking, well, what's better or how do you transition? Um, I'm saying just try to really focus in on making the portfolio that you think is going to keep getting you jobs. And that might include you transitioning from freelance to in-house to freelance or to in-house to another in-house, you know, you might constantly be jumping from job to job, expanding your knowledge and your skill set. Yeah, well, I guess I guess what you said before, like if if you if you keep moving your portfolio towards like achieving a like better better portfolio, basically, and and, 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 your style, and what and you want to do, yes, exactly. People will come will come to you. Actually, it, it happened in, in my past, like, but I I was like, you know, because my situation here is like here in Barcelona, the I mean, you have a lot of good studios, but mostly it's like uh, mobile games and the style is very cartoonish and stuff like that. And I can do it. I mean, I'm, I'm doing it right now. 
but uh, you, I mean, you you see what I'm doing with the, with this type of art that I'm doing. Yeah. It's more like towards realism and and film and stuff like that. And, and I would really love to do that. But uh, this one thing, like freelancing, maybe will be the option for me in, in the future. Right? Yeah. I don't know. I, I, and I'm trying to say I don't know either. Like I don't know. You yeah. know you better than I know you. I can. I'm only really critical of the work you do and what you say you want to do. Right. Yeah. But uh, my my. My strategy is to teach you how to stop getting distracted with these secondary things, you know? Yeah. Like, which is whether, whether I should do freelance or in-house. Like, no, I, I don't know because you might find that working in-house is what you truly love to do until you yeah. have a life change. And then it'll, yeah. it'll, it'll change. And that I can promise you that's going to happen. Okay? Yeah. Um, and then – and then if you have a position where you just have good work and people constantly are reaching out to you, then you're in a better position because then you can adapt to what is more important, which is life, right? Yeah. Because life is going to always be throwing you curveballs, man. Like I could promise yeah. you that. And, uh, and one, one thing that you want to do is like kind of like I was saying earlier, look less into goals but more into systems. Yeah. Right? I get it. Yeah, because if you do that, then you, you're going to be helping yourself. It's a, it's a long game, what I'm suggesting to you. Like, I can give you the short game, right? But that's not going to help you. Uh, it's, it's in my best interest to make you guys all badasses. And part of being a badass is to understand, to be patient and resilient, and to yeah. put all of your talent tree and talent points into the things that are always, basically build a better quality of life for the rest of your life. You know, there's a there's a great story um, about about what I'm talking about, and it changed my life when I heard this story. Uh, and I'll tell you guys the story now, since it's relevant, and then we'll just we'll just end class. <clears throat> if you guys have more questions, we have more Q and A's next week. Actually, classes go much faster um, through the critiques because we'll be on the home stretch. We'll be at the end of the the progress of your guys' work. Um, so feel free to ask questions then. If you did, if you had more questions, but I'm telling you guys a story that kind of reflects what you're you're getting at and kind of what some of the other students were bringing alluding to, okay? And the story is about like a fisherman, okay? This guy goes fishing every day, catches this beautiful exotic fish, he brings it home, he feeds it to his family, he has some beautiful kids and a wife, and he plays with his children after he feeds them and or they hang out, and then after dinner. He puts his kids to bed, and then he uh, dances with his wife. He goes dancing, and or he dances at the home and hangs out with his wife. And this is pretty much his life every day, right? One day, a businessman sees him. The businessman says to him, like, what kind of fish did you just catch? It's a, a beautiful-looking fish, right? And the guy's like, oh, yeah, it's this fish, and names it. It's irrelevant, the name. And then he's like, oh, man, that's a beautiful name, beautiful fish. Is it edible? Like, can you eat it? And he's like, yeah. You want to try some? The, guy, the businessman's like, yes. So the fisherman sits up, you know, a little uh, cooking station, cooks the fish, gives it to the businessman. The businessman tastes it and said, this is probably the most amazing fish I've ever had in my whole life. He's like, this is crazy. Like, not only is it a beautiful fish, it is also like a tasty one. And he's like, well, have you ever thought about selling this, like selling these fishes to other people? And he said, well, why would I want to do that, the fisherman said. And the businessman replies, well, you'll make more money, and then you can you know, get more fishing poles, and you can start fishing more, and you can invest in uh, hiring another person to help you. And he said, well, why would I want to do that? So, well, eventually, you can maybe like afford like a little shack or something and then start selling it in your local markets and make more money, hire more staff, have more equipment. And he's like, well, then why would I want to do that? He's like, well, eventually, you'll make so much money from your little thing, you can open up your own store, maybe like your own restaurant, where you can sell the fish and other other like kinds of uh, delicacies, and you can expand the kind of uh, menu items, and you can have fishing boats, like large fishing boats that go and gather tons of fish and whatever, right? And other things. And he's like, well, why would I want to do that? He's like, well, eventually you'll have enough money to afford it to go to international. You can have an industrial business around this and have it everywhere around the world. And you can have an armadas of fishes, fishermen, uh, fisher boats with 
thousands of employees and making millions, if not billions of dollars. And he's like, well, then why would I want to do that? And he's like, well, eventually you'll be so filthy rich, you know, you can make movies or you can invest in video games and merchandise, you know, off of your products. And he said, well, why would I want to do that? Like, why would I want to do any of this? And he says, well, eventually you, 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 all this stuff, you can, you can rest easy, rest tight and, and retire a filthy rich millionaire or billionaire or trillionaire and uh, do the things that you love. Like, what do you like to do? And the fisherman says, well, I like to go fishing every morning. I like to cook for my family. I like to play with my kids and dance with my wife at night. And the businessman says, yeah, you can do that. Do you see the, the moral of the story? Yeah. He's like, already he's to... already doing the things that he likes. Why does he have yeah. to get it? And that's when I heard that story, man, it was super reflective of my own career. I went to school, right? And I was like, well, then I need to get a job. I got a job. And I was like, well, once I get a job, I, you know, I need to get a better job. So then I got that better job. And I was like, well, I can't just have a better job. I need to have like I need to work for like the biggest companies. And I was like, all right. So then I started working for like biggest companies, right? And as this was going, I was just like, I actually, there came a point where I realized, like, I felt happier when I was trying to become a, an artist. Like, right when I was a student, like, many, like, very similar to where a lot of you guys are today, okay? Yeah. I was actually much happier then because I was all fresh and new. There was so much information. I was hanging out with my friends. We were painting, laughing, talking, hanging out all the time. <clears throat> and so... It, this realization came to me when I was working at Blizzard Entertainment, the company that I've always wanted to work for. Because even though I was working there, I felt like it wasn't, I wasn't over. It wasn't done. And then it made me think, like, when will this be done? <laughs> okay? And I went to GDC, and someone told me that fisherman story. Because we were talking about it. I was like, I don't know what I want to do next. I feel like, like, I, mean, I feel stuck. I'm not sure what to do. And so I was like, oh, let me tell you this story that is like an old wise tale. It might have some relevance to you. And I, he told it to me. And I was like, holy shit. Amazing. And it's like, the problem with my my situation isn't so much that uh, I'm not successful. I'm, I'm actually very successful. I've done many things. And I've done many things that are very unsuccessful. But the point is I've done really well. The problem is that. The problem is that I was chasing happiness. When that story reveals you can be happy today. You just choose not to. You, you, you believe that happiness is elsewhere. And uh, especially after having my tumor removed and I was at the hospital for, I had a lot of time to really reflect on this even more. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, after that, I just basically, after that story, I mean, which was about a year or two ago, uh, especially about a year ago, or a little bit more than a year ago, um, I decided to simplify my life. I basically distracted, was distracted with all this stuff. I just started cutting things out, you know? I started caring less and less about things and more and more about, like, less and less about my career and more and more about uh, my family, my friends, and my students. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, ironically, I make, I've made more money now than I've ever <laughs> had in the no, seriously. Um, and I work way less. Okay? So uh, it's, I, it, it's, it's quite possible. Now, I, I understand that the, the many years before of me practicing and working hard and being so thirsty for this uh, put me in a really good position today to actually to say, yeah, you know what? I'm, I can retire. Like a, a light retirement, you know? But uh, my point is, I don't think that I needed to work as crazy hard as I did. Okay? Yeah. And I'm trying to tell you guys, I have the hindsight to tell you guys and warn you guys of the same elements. And, you know, I wish I was the only person that felt this way. Trust me, man. I know all some of the greatest and best artists in this industry, and they have the same problem. In fact, it's a reoccurring problem I keep seeing. Uh, not only with my peers and like fellow badasses, but also just people in general. You know, I have friends who are literally mil millionaires. I live in Irvine, California. Um, 
where the wealthiest of wealthy people live. There's million dollar homes. We don't live in one. We, we can barely afford this apartment. Okay. <laughs> we live in an apartment and it's super expensive. And uh, we have friends who live in these like five bedroom, two story homes, 4,000 square feet with like stone jacuzzi in their backyard. Like this is the kind of people that we know. Okay. And we went, I remember one time we went to a, a family or not a family uh, dinner. We went to like a double date with them. And it became very clear to me and my wife that they they were very unhappy with their marriage. Um, even when I hung out with their kids, the kid I can tell is very neglected because whenever he sees me, he gets so excited. Like he's, because I'm very playful. I'm really like interact with children very well. And I'm like, Hey, let's play. And I taught him like a little bit of D and D and stuff. And he's like stoked. Right. And every time I see him, he's always inviting me to come over. He's like, Hey, can you come over? Can you come over? Can you come over? And um, that's a great sign of neglect because my kids don't do that with other pe people. <laughs> my kids are absolutely happy with me. They, I'm sure you guys heard them come in and even just say they love me just straight out. And especially now because I've been working from home. And I literally after this, I'm going to go play Diablo with them. <laughs> you know? And so, and so that is, is very clear to me that I, even if I had all the money in the world, like who gives a fuck if my kids don't care about me? Yeah. And there was a great – Great thing that I read recently, like about a half a year ago, um, and I'm going to end it here, where someone said in a book that I read, it said, you, you, time is the most valuable resource, and people don't realize that. People forget about that because some people think that they can either – they can both have a great career and have a great family life, but the reality is the opposite. There's not enough time to be great at either. Or I'm sorry, there's not enough time to be great at both. You have to choose. So either you're really great at your career or you're really great at your family life, but you can't have it both ways. Yeah. And I'm like, damn, that's intense. Another thing that hit me hard, <laughs> right? And it's still true because if I'm spending eight to 10 hours drawing and painting, yes, my wife understands that I'm working hard for the money, right? But my kids can know nothing more than that his dad works all the time yeah and so i made a very I, like i said i work less now and i make more money now which is great and it has a lot to do with um what i've done in the past so i've definitely had this opportunity but i'm trying to warn you guys that you guys can achieve the same thing modest growth if you have a lot of time in your hands like you don't have friends or people that want to hang out with you which is sad which i doubt you guys are in that situation or you have friends who are equally minded that they want to work hard and paint every day that's great then you can do it right you're not putting any cost to any other circumstance in fact you're sharpening your, your relationship with these people by working together for a larger goal right but uh don't sacrifice that type of stuff guys for their career trust me it's not the best strategy okay because you could die tomorrow yeah. Right? You could die tomorrow, which is very, very plausible. I don't want any of you guys to die. I mean, who is not here because someone passed away? Like, life is very, very fragile. Like, I could have not been here either, you know? Yeah. So, with that being said, do you want to play that, sweetheart? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll play it after. I'm just finishing up right now. Okay? Love you. I'll play too. Yeah, you can play too, Julian. Uh, um, close the door, please. Thank you, guys. Uh, all right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate y'all. I'm gonna go play with my kids now. <laughs> like, I'm telling you guys, like, okay, you, know, you guys are you guys are on the right path. You guys are part of the the elite. Trust me on that. There's very small uh, subset of people in this world who have access, let alone the ambition. And you guys are amongst those people, so don't squander it. Okay. Um. And I, be I believe a high rate of you guys will make it. I believe in about three years from the time of the class, you get, most of you guys will do well. Uh, and this is true. It's already true for a lot of my students. A lot of my students are doing extremely well now. Um, and, and it's a product of them re working really hard. I've, this has only been two years in the making for some of my students. I told all of my students three to five years usually is a good gauge of how long it might take you to get in a good position to make a good leave living if you work modestly hard, okay? Modestly, meaning that you don't just twiddle your thumbs and never do anything, 
right, for like weeks on end. But like if you do at least three to four hours every day, that's pretty moderate. And you, you should be doing pretty fine. Okay, so keep that in mind. Or you could just grind it out, just work freaking crazy hard till your hair falls out like I did <laughs> and for like a year or two and get okay <laughs> at our work. Like I did that for like a, two years. I just worked so crazy hard, like 10 to 12 hour days. Um, but that's because I felt that I was no, I had no talent, so I had to fake it, you know? I was like, I'm not a talented artist, so I had to fake the crap out of this. And so, um, but then I realized, as a consequence of that, I realized, oh, this is like totally obtainable. This is not a talent-based thing at all. This is a skill-based thing. So remember that, all right? All right, guys. Thank you guys for all the good work, hard work. Keep up the, the epicness. Appreciate you guys' time, and uh, talk to you guys later. Have a great weekend. You have a better one, on. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.